everyone and welcome to Luwapa News, a program made by Scouts for Scouts, right here in the Northeastern Pennsylvania Council. My name is Leo Cahagis and welcome to all of our viewers from throughout Pennsylvania and across the country. On this special field edition of Luwapa News, we'll be filming right here in everyone's favorite Goose Pond Scout Reservation. We'll be checking out a variety of scout skills from all the different stations around the pond. To start off, let's head over to Scoutcraft with CJ. All right, Iloapa News. My name's CJ, and today we're going to talk a little bit about axe safety. So, one of the first things you want to consider in axe safety is how you're going to store your axe. So, typically when you store an axe, you want to make sure you have some sort of sheath or cover on top of it. That'll help keep your axe from getting wet and rusting, which a rusty tool uh, usually ends up being a dull tool and very dangerous. And that'll just protect your axe from getting whacked and accidentally maybe falling out and cutting something. So you always want to make sure you have a sheath on your axe, typically made out of leather or plastic. And you want to make sure if you have an axe, let's say in a troop trailer, it's got a sheath on it. And typically troops will keep them in like a troop toolbox, which will help them from falling out and cutting things possibly by accident in the troop trailer. So the next thing I want to talk to you guys about is how do you get your axe from where you store it to where you're going to use it. So typically when you are taking an axe to go use it, you're going to have to carry it somewhere. So when you carry an axe, you always want to make sure you take your hand, this little part of the axe uh, at the bottom here, you can always wrap your hand around that because there's no sharp edge on that, and wrap your hand around the top. And you want to make sure you take the axe, keep it at your side, and that'll keep it so that way, let's say you trip over a root or a rock in the woods, you're not going to take the axe then and cut yourself with it. You're going to have the axe just going right into the ground. You never want to, let's say, Leo, come over here real quick. When I'm handing Leo an axe, let's say if I'm going to pass an axe to Leo, I'm not going to take the axe and I'm not going to go and just give it right to Leo. Whenever you pass an axe, you always want to hold it as you carry it and hand him the handle. There you go. Good job, Leo. Thanks, CJ. Thanks, Leo. So that's how you handle and uh, pass an axe. So now I want to talk to you guys about how do you, let's say, use an axe. So in Scouts, we don't want to go out into the woods and just go down and cut down trees randomly. We typically want to use wood like this. This is just some wood that we found in the woods. It was, we cut it up, cut the edges, and we started splitting a log. So you want to make sure that you're not cutting down living trees. You want to use the dead ones around you, first of all. So the other thing about using an axe is there's a couple different ways to, what you're going to usually do with an axe is split wood. So there's one way that's the common practice, and then there's one way that's the safest practice. So your typical common practice for splitting wood is you want to have your feet shoulder width apart, you want to have your hand up at the top of the axe head, and you want to have your other hand down here at the uh, bottom of the axe where it starts to widen out. When you want to take the axe above your head, you're going to slide your hand down and put all your power into the piece of wood that you're going to split. So a lot of issues with that position there that you could split wood with is sometimes I've seen scouts with their feet right next to each other, right together, instead of having their feet shoulder width apart. That is very dangerous, guys. So an axe is a really sharp tool, and when you're splitting wood, you're putting a lot of force behind it and you could accidentally possibly skip off the wood and go right into your leg where there's some very major arteries right there that if you cut, it's very bad news. There's also, kids will sometimes miss the log. They don't have the greatest hand-eye coordination and that's not good either because yet again, you could hit your legs. And there's a lot of things that can go wrong if you hit your legs. So you wanna make sure you always have your feet shoulder width apart when you're using your legs. So that's the safe and common method but then there's a safest method for when you're cutting wood. So the safest method involves um, actually getting down on your knees with the ax, and then you could split the wood with it standing up, or you could actually take the wood and lay it down. Now this is a very safe method, because what you're gonna use is you're gonna use a chopping block. Just like before, when you're splitting wood, standing up, you're gonna use a chopping block to prevent ax from going into the ground, hitting a rock, and possibly dulling the edge, rolling the edge. If you're down on your knees already and using a chopping block, 
that's a great thing because you can't over swing because your knees and your waist is typically going to be a little bit below the chopping block, which will keep you from missing and skipping off and into your leg. And it'll actually, so it'll protect you and it'll protect your tool. So same thing as before, you'd have your hand at the top, slide down and put all your force into the piece of wood. So the last thing I want to cover with you guys is how do you sharpen an ax? So there's two big method, big ways to sharpen an ax and you can actually use both tools or you could just use one or the other. So my favorite method to sharpen an ax is I'll go and I'll look at my ax and if I have any rolls or nicks or bends in the ax head, I'll take a file and I'll first file those out. Right now I don't have any in my ax head and I'll use the file typically and I'll help it reprofile the blade. Then after that I'll take one of these round whetstones. This is called a sharpening puck and there's a rougher side and a smoother side. We'll wet the puck and then we'll go in small circular motions on the axe and that'll just give you a finer, more sharper edge. So that's really, uh, one, actually one other thing I want to cover with you guys. So getting what your axe yard is, I, I covered how to split wood, but I forgot about how to split wood the safest way, which would be having an axe yard. So an axe yard is typically, the minimum size you can have for one would be one axe and arm length out all the way around you and one axe length up and plus an arm length up. And you want to make sure you have that as your minimum space so that way when you're swinging, you're not swinging and hitting branches above you and that way you're not, if you end up swinging this way, which you should never do with an axe, you're not going to hit somebody around you. That's the minimum size for an axe yard. You typically want to have one that's a lot bigger than that because as you're using an axe or a saw, you're going to be cutting and splitting wood and you're going to end up with a lot of material around you, which is going to make it harder to work if it's of that smaller size. So all in all, guys, that's about all I have for you guys today. So thank you guys. Make sure you use your axes safely and have fun. Thanks a lot, CJ. Before we head over to our next segment, let's get a check on the weather with the weather rock. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Cool. Okay. Great. Thank you. Well, uh, there's going to be weather. Let's head over to Alex at Aquatics for some canoe facts. Hi, I'm Alex McCoolin. I got to work the last two summers down here at the Goose Pond Aquatics area where I had the opportunity to teach canoeing and whitewater merit badge, some of my favorite badges during my time in scouting. Today I want to outline and, and, un, and underline some of the uh, important fundamental parts of a canoe and just cover some of the basic canoeing skills that you should have before you take on the water. These will help not only if you decide to take canoeing or whitewater merit badge, but also during some of those, uh, those basic uh, scout rank requirements. So, we have here a pretty basic canoe, okay, and I'm going to outline some of the parts for you. So down here, we have the back of our boat, okay? In, in nautical terms, we call this the stern, okay? The stern of our boat, okay? We have the stern and also the stern seat, okay? This is where all the steering in the boat happens, okay? If you have two people taking on a canoe, one of them has canoeing experience and one of them doesn't, you want the person with experience in the stern of the boat, okay? In the back of their boat. You can identify this as the stern by how much space there is around the seat, okay? So if you notice, there's not a lot of room behind the seat, okay? Your, your paddler would be facing forward this way. There's not a lot of room towards this side of the seat, okay? So you wanna make sure that your legs are off to this side and that you're facing the bow of the boat. So that obviously brings us to the other side of our boat. This is the bow, okay? The front of our boat is the bow, okay? The bow and the bow seat. Our paddler would be facing forward. They don't do any of the steering in a, in a canoeing situation, okay? They're pretty much the engine of the ship. Their, their job is forward motion the job of the stern paddler to make sure that you're going in a straight line. We also have some other basic parts. We have our center line that runs down the center of our boat. Okay, anytime that you're, you know, need to focus on balancing your boat, if you're hitting some, some rockier waters, you want to keep that center line in mind. The further you are away from that center line, the more likely that your boat is going to be rocking back and forth and could possibly capsize. We also have our gunnels. Our gunnels run along the outside of our boat and we have our thwarts. Thwarts are any beam that runs down the, that runs from one gunnel to the other. These are great not only for the structure of our boat, but they're also a great place to tie on things. Going 
going on a longer trip, you want to make sure that you tie everything that you need to your boat. That way, in, in the case of a capsize, you don't lose uh, you know, your cooler full of food for the weekend down the river. So those are kind of our basic parts on the front side. I'm going to roll it over, and you can see the whole underside is the hull of our boat. Okay, this is uh, the hull of our boat, and we also have our keel. Okay, you'll find uh, a keel on pretty much any boat, uh, and it, as to how big and how prominent it is depends on uh, the type of boat and what it's used for. Uh, this one, this one here is, is you know fairly prominent. What this does is it helps keep our boat straight. Okay, helps keep our keep our boat moving in a straight line. Those are those are kind of the fundamentals of a of a canoe, uh, and uh, I'd, I'd suggest if you you know, if you want to get out on the water, uh, educate yourself, make sure you're following the uh, BSA safety float and safe swim defense and enjoy your time out on the water. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alex. For the next segment on the program, let's head over to the Nature Lodge with Stephen Frankowitz. Hey, Lou off the news. Uh, I'm Stephen Frankowitz and uh, I'm here at the Nature Lodge right now at Goose Pond. And uh, we're going to go over some basic nature things today. So first of all, we're going to go over fishing for a little bit. So um, we're going to walk around the pond a little bit. Uh, maybe try to catch some fish and see if there's any animals around. Um, so we'll start off with fishing stuff first. Um, I have my equipment right here. Uh, this is a basic fishing pole. Um, it's got a bobber and a hook set up on it, nothing special. And I have my tackle box right here with all my equipment in it. Um, so when you're fishing, you always want to make sure you keep your distance from everybody. Uh, that way you don't accidentally hook somebody. Uh, there's no real like distance you should keep from somebody, but a good five or six feet away, just so you don't accidentally like swing your pole to the side and hit somebody, uh, that would be a good indicator to stay away from people. Um, also when you're fishing, you want to make sure you stay in the right areas. So uh, I know here at Goose Pond we can't have anybody fishing in the swimming or boating areas, just so if there's anybody fishing they don't accidentally step on a hook or you don't accidentally catch a person. Um, you also want to make sure that you are somewhere where you won't get snagged a lot. Uh, if you keep getting stuck in trees and everything, you're not going to have a good time. So make sure you try to go somewhere where there's not a lot of trees or not a lot of weeds in the uh, lake. Alright, um, another thing you want to have when you're fishing is uh, your license. So on my hat here, you can see I have my fishing license. Um, you have to be 16 or older to have a license. If you're below that, you don't need a license to go fishing. Uh, there's also free fishing days here in Pennsylvania where you don't need a license at all. Uh, I know that uh, major holidays have those days, like Memorial Day and uh, Fourth of July, they're free fishing days. Um, there's also limits and things you need when you're fishing. Uh, a fish has to be a certain size to catch. Uh, they all have their different individual sizes, but they have to be a right size to keep. If they're too small, you got to throw them back. Uh, there's also limits on how many fish you can catch. Uh, again, certain fish have their own amounts. Uh, I know that bluegill and panfish and all that, you can catch about 50 of them a day before you have to stop. Okay, and another important thing when you're fishing is a hat. So a hat has two purposes. One, it, you put your license on it, but two, it keeps hooks from going into your eyes. So say there's a bad cast, right, and it's flying near your face. It could catch the brim of your hat instead of going into your eyes. Uh, another good thing to keep hooks out of your eyes are sunglasses. Uh, they also keep the sun out of your eyes. and it helps you to not damage your eyesight while you're looking into the water because the sun will bounce off the water and go into your eyes. Alright, and um, other good things to wear are sunscreen, bug spray, stuff like that. Especially if you're out in a boat and you want to wear sunscreen. Alright, so uh, we're going to take a walk around the pond, maybe try to catch a fish and see if there's any animals around. Hey guys, uh, hello Wapanoos, uh, I'm Stephen Frankowitz, uh, we're here at Goose Pond right now and um, we're looking at some wildlife right now. So if you look on the ground here, that is a leopard frog. Uh, it's got its name leopard frog because, as you can see, there's spots on it like a leopard. Um, they're pretty common frogs around here. Uh, they're probably one of the most common ones you'll find here. Uh, but yeah, this one's just kind of sitting in the middle of the road. And, uh, nope. Kind of peed on me a little bit there, but uh, they're, really, they're really good jumpers, as you can see. Uh, he's just hanging out here by the mud puddle here. Nope, I'm not going to catch him, but uh, lots of wildlife around here. Very nice to see these frogs this time of year. Hey guys, so uh, as you can see over there, there's a chipmunk there. and They're probably one of the most common little mammals you can find running around here. Um, 
Chipmunks are always fun to see. They're really kind of cute little animals, I would I would say so. So uh, yeah, that's a chipmunk, and you'll see a lot of them here. All right, guys. So on the lily pad over there, we have a blue dragonfly. Uh, dragonflies are very interesting animals. Uh, they don't really live very long, so they have a very short life cycle. Uh, I believe it's only for some of them it's a day, for others it's a few days. Others it's a week, but most of them it's just a day. Um, dragonflies are very interesting. They like to hang out in warm areas, so they're right here in the swamp. There's plenty of sunlight for them, and uh, this one's just basking on a lily pad right now. Um, most dragonflies that sit on lily pads like that aren't very fortunate. Sometimes a bass or a fish comes up and gets them from underneath. Um, but most of the time they just sit there and fly around. Okay guys, so up in the tree right above us here, there's a red-winged blackbird up there. Um, they're called red-winged blackbirds because they have little orange or red spots on their wings. Uh, they're very common around here in the swamp. I see them pretty much every time I'm walking through here. And uh, you could probably hear his call as he's uh, going on in the background there. Alright guys, so let me be very quiet not to disturb this wild creature. But if you look over there, that's Jake Weston. And he is performing camp maintenance right now. That's his natural call right now, the weed whacker. Alright guys, so on the ground here we have a red F. It's a type of newt. And uh, they like to hang out right after it rains. So it was raining here yesterday, and we got a red F on the ground here. They're very common. Uh, you see them crawling around there. Uh, they're very common after it rains, and you'll see a lot of them up here at Goose Pond. Alright, hey guys, so um, we're here in the rock here at Goose Pond, a very popular fishing spot, and uh, we just caught a fish here. Uh, he's putting up quite a bit of a fight. We'll see what it is. It's a nice sized bluegill, look at that. Alright, so I'm going to bring him up to the camera so you guys can see him. Uh, bluegill are probably the most common fish you're going to catch here at Goose Pond. They're pretty much everywhere. All right, so this is our little bluegill, and I'm going to show you how to take the hook out. So, um, you can't really see it right now, but uh, bluegill have spines on their back. See how they popped up right there? So I like to grab them right by the stomach and squeeze. Other people like to grab them by the spines and push the spines down with their palm while they grab it. I just grab them by the belly. And you just take the hook, and all you got to do is just pull out the same way it came in. It does not hurt the fish at all. As you can see, the hook's out. He's fine. And then we just throw them right back in the water. And there you go. That's all there is to it. Thanks, Steven. Let's head over to the campfire site right here for one of my all-time favorite things from summer camp. A campfire song performed by Matt and JP. Hi guys, I'm Matt. I'm JP. And uh, for the last episode of Luwapa News, we wanted to bring you out here to Goose Pond and uh, play a camp classic for you that if you're anything like me, I know you're going to be missing this summer, and that's Eagle on His Chest that we play uh, the closing campfire every single week. So please enjoy this, and maybe it'll bring a little piece of the pond uh, into your home. His plans are already made. Today he will stand upon that stage with his mother and father by side. He'll take an oath with pride, a promise to always give his best, and then they'll pit an eagle on. And all the boys will watch them call his name, and to them he will never be the same. His words will inspire, fill them with desire, a hero stands before the rest, because he wears an And he's a leader of tomorrow, standing here today. And he learned about integrity somewhere on the way. And if you ask him why he lives like this, you know that he will say, 
Thank you guys. Thank It'll be you. a great summer. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, JP. That song sounds better every time I hear it. Let's head over to Mr. Cerebro for the Scoutmasters Minute. Thanks for having me back, Leo. Hello again, everyone. For those of you who don't remember, my name is Dave Cerebro. I'm the staff advisor to the Wapanoo Lodge, and I'm also the camp director here at Goose Pond Scout Reservation. I'm coming, you, coming to you tonight from the camp office, which is generally the central hub of operations when summer camp is busy and in full swing. So I'm very much at home here. It's a second, uh, second home away from home for me. And I thought I'd take a few minutes and as I enjoy the sun setting over the lake as we look out the window tonight, um, to enjoy the quiet beauty that is Goose Pond. Although I think I'd much rather hear the sounds of scouts echoing through the trees. Um, anyway, here we are. Ten episodes of Luapa News Later, and I've been asked to deliver some parting thoughts for you on tonight's episode, a Scoutmaster's Minute, if you will. And the subject of my Scoutmaster's Minute is the holiday that's coming up this weekend as we celebrate Independence Day, the 4th of July. Um, and sometimes I think this holiday, like a lot of other holidays, gets kind of lumped into the defocusedness of uh, why we celebrate these days. Why do we have these days in our, in our nation, our culture? Why are they deemed significant? Um, as opposed to a day off from school or work or an uh, excuse to maybe throw a party. Um, but anyway, think about the meaning of what Independence Day is all about and how that came to be, and I'm going to share some thoughts with you about that. One of the things I like to do every year, the day before the 4th of July, is pull out an old favorite reading of mine, and it's a letter from John Adams to his wife Abigail um, that was written the day after the Declaration of Independence was signed. And... The citizens at that time were so excited, so thrilled to have gotten the Declaration of Independence signed. They were truly an independent nation after so much fighting, blood, sweat, and tears to, to get away from oppression and tyranny. 
um, and be their own people and their own independent nation. So it was really a big deal for them. But one of the things that is in that letter, um, John Adams talks about, is that the Declaration of Independence should have been signed seven months previous to when it actually was. Um, and if that had happened, um, our nation may have been very different. A lot of different things potentially could have come out and happened, and our nation could be a lot, a lot more uh, different than it is today. Um, why was it delayed seven months? was delayed because of a little thing called the pandemic of smallpox, which was attacking our, uh, our, the soldiers on the front lines. And so that, I think, is kind of apropos to share with you today as we kind of have some setbacks and some uh, things that are happening in our world today as we kind of battle to, to move forward and, and struggle a little bit. Anyway, there's a, there's, a, there's a sentence or two in the letter, and it talks about um, John Adams and how he foreshadowed um, the greatness of Independence Day. And I just want to read it for you. He says, I am apt to believe that this day will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the greatest anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade and shows and games and sports and guns and bells and bonfires and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other, from this time forward forevermore. Pretty apropos. I, I just thought he was so foreshadowing and how important this day was. And here we are doing a lot of those very same things today to celebrate our independence. So think about that. The Declaration of Independence conjures up a, a couple of words. Uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And these are kind of defined as the unal un inalienable rights given to us by God and uh, supposed to be protected and granted to us by our government. Um, pretty, pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. And I always think that when you're at camp but here at Goose Pond, Goose Pond is one of the best places in the world to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. And so is scouting in general. I mean, if you really think about it, um, the days you spend in scouting may seem like not much right now, but I assure you, these are the best days of your lives. Carpe diem, seize the day. Get everything you can out of the scouting program. Stick with it. Recruit other people. There's a popular saying right now in America, um, make America great again. And that leads you to believe that maybe America is not great anymore and we need to make it great again. But my friends, do not be fooled. America is pretty darn great right now as it is. End of sentence. Um, so think about that and rejoice in the fact that we live in the greatest nation on the planet Earth. So, I kind of leave you with a few words. Um, cherish America, leave a legacy, be a servant leader, um, and, and know that you can do amazing things when you work for the love of the thing. Um, with that, I admonish you to celebrate our independence, but do so safely. Um, keep scouting strong, see, and I hope to see you around the pond again very soon. Thank you, scouts. Back to you, Leo. Thank you very much, Mr. Cerebro. Well, folks, that just about does it for this special field edition of Lawapa News. We hope you enjoyed all the special filming and programming around Goose Pond Scout Reservation. Until next time for Lawapa News, this has been Leo Cahagis reminding you to keep on scouting.